from the subject, subject, I have the same subject as I had on New Year's Eve. My subject is a command, seek the Lord. Everybody say, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Father, bless us now as we, as we preach the word of the Lord. I pray, O oh God, that I am heard as never before, that the message that you've given me to deliver to the people of God, that everyone who have ears to hear, will hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. In Jesus' name, amen. Seek the Lord. In addition to seeking the Lord, there are three other things that I wish to highlight today in the text. And they are very, very, very important. And I want you to hear me. You know, if, you don't, if you don't get happy, I, I need you to hear me today. One of the things I want to tell you about this message is that this message is a message to survivors. Amen. A message to survivors. And it is a message of restoration. And it is a message of recovery. Not everybody swept through 2018. Not everybody in 2018 got a new house or got a new job, or had their fondest dreams realized. For some, 2018 was a nightmare. For some, 2018 was your 70 years. But you survived 2018. You, you survive. The survivors are those, those who continue to live after or in spite of. In spite of what happened, I'm here today. And I'm saved. And I pressed into the kingdom and some difficult things happened to me. But I survived every one of them. To be sitting here today. This message is a message of restoration. That is the act of giving from God and getting from us back what was taken. To bring back to the former or normal state. Some people lost things and their lives got thrown uh, uh, upside down. But God knows how to restore, to bring back what was taken. Bring back the former or normal conditions. Somebody's asked, wondering, Lord, what's going on in my life? Were things ever... Calm down. Get back to the way they were. The answer is yes. It's a message of recovery. That is to get back. To get back to a state of control and balance and composure. For some, your world, things have just been out of control. Your children out of control. Your marriage out of control. Health out of control. If it's not this, it's that. If it wasn't that, it was the other. God says, I want to bring things back 
and put things back into balance. Bring back a state of composure. All of this is in our text. In 2019, God is going to bless the survivor. Sister Mose, you survived 2018. Death in the family. Sickness. Di di dire diagnosis. In family and having to deal with things in yourself. But God. Got you sitting there and a district missionary and sanctified today. Ain't God good. I, I could point out a whole lot of people. I, I, see, I, I, could, I could point out a few folk who said, man, I really, Pastor, you're right. It was the year of the presser that is pressing into the kingdom, but also the year where I had to press my way. Yeah. There will be, if I be a prophet of God, a divine recovery that will most certainly take place and a restoration that is on the way. And it is, as Isaiah said, for the thirsty. And for those who will seek the Lord. Now, let's go to the text because I want you to follow me. Verse 1 says, these are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem. So, we're going to preach a letter today. All right? Amen. And, and, and it's an official letter written by the prophet himself. He received these instructions from God. And the prophet, when he wrote this letter, he was, was still in Jerusalem. He wrote this letter while still being in Jerusalem to the captives who had been taken away into exile. And yet, even though they had been departed uh, into Babylon, the prophet rightly felt that he had the God-given responsibility to write to them. Isn't it wonderful that even in the midst of your trouble, God will still send you a word. Amen. So they were taken captive, but they needed to hear something from the Lord. And this letter, according to the first verse, was written to the elders, and to the priests and the prophets those whom King Nebuchadnezzar had taken captive. Elders there deal with the aged. But elders are also persons of dignity. Persons of rank. The powerful and the influential. People of privilege. These people Nebuchadnezzar took captives. Along with the priests and along with the prophets. All of them, they were a part of uh, this second deportation. Follow me now. This letter was written to the survivors of this deportation. Now, let me tell you how special these people were. The distance, the approximate distance from Jerusalem to Babylon unless you found a shortcut, was over 1,600 miles. These people were uprooted from their homeland. Uh, there was no train. There, was no pla there were no planes. They had to walk from Jerusalem to Babylonia. See, by now, to explain something, by now, the Babylonians had already conquered the Assyrians. 
the superpower of the world at this time was Babylon. The Assyrians had conquered the northern kingdom and taken them captive. Well, the Babylonians had conquered the Assyrians and now we see them conquering the southern kingdom, which is called Judah. He captures these people and have them to walk from Jerusalem to Babylon. Can you imagine the complaints of the privileged, of the rich, of the powerful? So when you're in captivity, everybody's the same. Praise the Lord. And they're all walking. And uh, many died on the way. Not all of the elderly were strong enough to make the trip. Not all of the young were strong enough to make the trip. Many graves and dead bodies strode the road from Judah, the southern kingdom, to Babylon. But this letter was to those who survived. The number of the exiles was around 8,000. If you look at 2 Kings chapter 24 and uh, verse 16 says, and all the men of might, look at who he, who he captured, the men of might even 7,000 and craftsmen and smiths a thousand. And look, look, look at this. All that were strong and apt for war, even them the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. What was the strategy? We're not going to leave anybody in Judah who could possibly organize themselves and put together a militia to fight against us. So we're going to take everybody who can make instruments, everybody who can fight, everyone who could organize the people, anybody who could get folk together to put up a fight against us, we're taking them now before they even form an army. We're going to take them. What a strategy. We're going to take them to Babylon. So they were taken, and these people survived the trip. And according to verse 2, this letter was written to the exiles after a great fall had taken place. This letter wasn't written to them in their glory. This letter was written to them when they were actually quite demoralized and embarrassed. Jeconiah the king who was also called Jehoiakim and also called by Jeremiah Kaniah, he and uh, his mother the queen mother Nehusta had been taken captive. Let me lay this foundation. 2 Kings chapter 24 verse 8 and I have to remember while I'm preaching that the whole congregation is not the 8 a.m. class. We 8 o'clockers love this kind of detail. The rest of the people say, get on with it, preacher. But in verse 8 of 2 Kings chapter 24, Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned in Jerusalem, look at this, three months. And his mother was Nehushta, the daughter of Elnathan of Jerusalem. Look at this. He didn't reign but uh, three months. And, and the writer summed up his reign. Just three months, you saw which way he was going. It says, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. According to all that his father had done, he walked in the sins of Jehoiakim. He should have learned because, uh, and I'll get to it, 
uh, Nebuchadnezzar had already attacked his father, made inroads, and departed some of the people. That was what Daniel covered when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was taken. They were part of the first uh, captives in the deportation, and that happened in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim. Now Jehoiakim's son is king, and you would think he would have learned from the wickedness of his father and repented and got right. No, he uh, doubled down in the wickedness. So now here he is, uh, three months, we see where he's going. So he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And at that time, verse 10, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. This is the second attack, and they surrounded the city. They besieged it. They controlled who went in, and they controlled who went out. They controlled what went in, and they controlled what went out. And the city was already beleaguered. And the, the uh, morale of the people were already down because they had a wicked leader. And the spiritual temperament of the people was already in bad shape. And they were all mad with the prophet Jeremiah because he was prophesying at the time, telling every one of them to get right. And he warned them, but when they wouldn't, he pronounced judgment. And he told them, if you read Jeremiah chapter 25, Jer Jeremiah told them, there's no point in you even fighting against uh, Babylon. He said, because God had sent them. And they are going to win. And said, to fight against them would be foolish. And the re why? Because the Lord had passed judgment. Saints, don't stay in sin too long. See, oh, I, I know you're grown and you can do what you want, and that preacher can't tell me what to do. But, but, but you're not God. And, and you, can, you can go past your day of grace, and God can uh, declare judgment. And once the Lord declares it, that's it. He can proclaim it, and you can repent. But once it's declared, you've set something in motion that cannot be stopped. And you will find, if you study chapter 24, uh, Jeremiah chapter 25, you hear Jeremiah preaching for the Babylonians. Said so they are going to win, and anybody, any nation that come up against them, uh, they're going to lose because God has raised them up. See, the God of the Bible is the God who controls nations. God controls Russia. God controls Israel. God controls Syria. Everything that's going on. You look, learn to look past CNN. Look past MSNBC. Look past ABC, CBS, NBC. Look past Fox and see what God is doing. Now, for me, it's as plain as the nose on your face. The moves that the God of the Bible is making. And I want to say something to America. America is in trouble if you don't get right with God. We change the definition of marriage. We're in trouble. We deck the White House out in homosexual colors. We're in trouble. We've had record abortions and the babies being slaughtered. Thank God for the happy warriors. They saved two babies yesterday. To God be the glory. We see Christianity defaced and demeaned and we see the religion of false gods honored in this country today. We better pay attention. Black folk, stop letting these little fads that come up make you question Christianity. What's wrong with you? Stop making, well, well what color was Jesus? And well, well what, about, what about the name Jesus? And all? Let, let me tell you something. The Lord brought us out and raised us up 
Now look at the descendants of slaves and look how good we are doing. And instead of us getting right with God, as soon as our young folk go to school and hear something remotely different, here they come back home looking at the parents funny, questioning what they've been taught all their lives. You better watch that. Because all these little fads, they come and go. They come and go. But the word of the Lord abideth forever. God has the last say. He's bigger than just what's going on in your life and my life. The God we serve controls nations. Yes. He told them, you're going down. So Nebuchadnezzar, he's surrounded. Am I, are you following me? He's surrounded uh, Jerusalem. And then after he besieged the city, a little time passed between verse uh, 10 and verse uh, 11. Time passed. And then guess what happened? In verse 11, the king showed up himself. Good God Almighty. Out steps the mighty king of Babylon himself. He shows up after he has gotten the word that we have sufficiently starved them. The fight is gone from them. Their king is ready to surrender. Uh, but, but, they, but they never got right. They never listened to, to, to Jeremiah. But we, we've broken their spirits. Uh, sister walking in right there. Darling, it's good to see you. How you feeling? Praise the Lord. God bless you and heaven smile upon you. She got ill during the, the New Year's Eve service, but she was in church. I'm proud of you, sister. God bless your heart. So now, look at this. Look at this. So the king shows up and his servants. And look what happened. Uh, uh, Judah knew what, it, what, meant, what they were communicating with emissaries. And look, what, look at what happened. And Jehoiachin, which, which is Jeconiah, which is the king of our text in Isaiah, uh, in, in Jeremiah 29, he shows up and the king of Judah went out to Babylon, to, went out to the king of Babylon. He and his mother and his servants, his entire administration, uh, all of his top brass and his princes and his officers, and look at what they did. They went out there and they surrendered. And the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. That last phrase is not referencing the eighth year of Jehoiachin's reign because he'd only reigned three months. But in the eighth year of Nebuchadnezzar, he walks out and the king of Israel surrounds, he, he surrenders. He, he's a far cry from David. The fight was gone. Judgment was passed. Now let's give him credit. That was the wisest move he could have made because his predecessor, the, the, his predecessor uh, Zedekiah, somebody talked him in to trying to fight against uh, 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 the king of Babylon and he ended up getting the whole city burned up. Matter of fact, one writer said they talked Zedekiah into making a move that was foolish. Because the prophet Jeremiah had already said, you can't fight this one. You got in this shape because of your sin. Why not come out of sin before you get messed up? Why not get right while there is time? Some of us just stay on that horse, just stay on it. Just, well, I ain't ready yet. I ain't, I'm not ready yet. Then, then God gives you a thumbs down. Then here you come running to the Lord, but you get upset because... Things that you set in motion, they, they still continue to happen. And where is the Lord? Why don't the Lord fix this? I'll tell you where the Lord is. The Lord is where he was when he told you to repent when there was time. That's where the Lord is. See, I'm teaching you how God works. Somebody today is going to hear the altar open. We're going to give you a chance to get saved. And you're going to walk away without getting saved. That's your right. But if you walk into judgment, don't blame the church. Hopefully someone will give their hearts to the Lord. 
He went out and he surrendered. He surrendered. This was 597 B.C. He surrendered. And look at what the king did. Verse 13 says, And he carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon the king had made in the temple of the Lord. Now, can you imagine this? You, you've read about Solomon's temple and how glorious it was. Well, by this second uh, surrender, this second deportation, see, most of the valuable stuff had been taken in verse 1 through 1 and down of this same chapter. For that was the first attack. And that's why Daniel tells us how he took all of the people who had the potential to serve in the king's court in Daniel chapter 1. And he went into the temple of God and took all of the vessels that were in the temple of God and took them out and he took them to Shinar, the land of his God. Well, in biblical times, when you would take the gold from one God, one religion, and take it into your house of worship, it symbolized your God conquering their God. So Nebuchadnezzar had already begun to conquer in the eyes of the people the God of Israel when actually the God of Israel was behind all of this because he had passed judgment on his people. But the, the, the gold had already been taken. So now this time the king goes in and the gold that's on the walls, the gold that's in the woodwork, the gold that's the remaining gold, they carve it out and they take it and they capture all these people. And they take all of these people. Look at verse 15. It says, and carried away Jehoiakim to Babylon and the king's mother and the king's wives and his officers and the mighty uh, of the land. Those carried he into captivity from Jerusalem. And but even though, are you following me? They were carried into captivity. Jeremiah said, I still need to write. I still need to try to tell them that God has not forgotten about them. Would you look at that person next to you and tell them, neighbor, the God of the Bible has not forgotten about you. So, praise the Lord. So, they are in Babylon. And they are captured. Am I preaching? Jeremiah gets or finds out that uh, King Zedekiah, who was put in place by the king of Babylon. Uh, and his name was Zedekiah when he put him in place. He put him in place to change his name. So, he's sending some uh, emissaries and a delegation, that's the word I'm searching for, to Babylon to get instructions from the king. Jeremiah, being the cunning prophet that he was, uh, found two men, uh, Elder Amachuku, who was like-minded. Elisha and Gemara. These men believed like Jeremiah. So he found some men he could trust. Saints, be trustworthy now. Amen. Don't talk too much. Amen. You know something? If you're exposed to information, be quiet. The more you know, the more humble you ought to be. Amen. You don't let it go to your head. You stay humble. Am I preaching good? So, so he finds two men that he can trust with this letter. And they take the letter to the saints who are in exile. And while in exile, it gets worse for them. Number one, they're in a new land that they're not familiar with. See, this is the exile that Habakkuk uh, would not accept. Habakkuk said to the Lord, God, I want you to judge what's going on in Israel and in Jerusalem, in the southern kingdom. And God tells Habakkuk, say, I'm going to send someone from the north, and they're going to take you captive. 
And Habakkuk said, oh, no, you can't do that because these people are too wicked. And, uh, and uh, Habakkuk said, now I'm going to set me upon my watch and I'm going to wait and see what the Lord will say unto me because I know God's not going to do this. And the Lord came back to Habakkuk and said, write the vision and make it plain that he that readeth may run. Praise God. For the vision shall come to pass and it shall not tarry. I'm sending the Babylonians. I'm sending the Chaldeans to get you. So, so now they are in Babylon. While in Babylon, the citizens of Babylon made fun of them. They said to them, sing one of them Zion songs. David covered it in the Psalms. And they said, how can we sing a Zion song in a strange land? Oh, they hated being captured. See, the Jews, the Hebrews were a proud people. They loved Jerusalem. Taken from the land that Abraham had promised them. Ripped from the land that Moses led them to. Taken from the land of David. And uh, soon thereafter, the mighty temple of Solomon would be burned to a crisp. And all of the mansions and the big houses and the, all of the uh, niceties of the southern kingdom would all go up in smoke. People killed, bodies led, littered in the streets. Oh, it was something. People mourning their dead loved ones. People going through. So there were, remember I just read, there were prophets and priests who were in the, the deportation. But they were false prophets. So to comfort the people, you have to be careful when you're going through and you want comfort. Because not everybody who comforts you have your best interests at heart. See, when you're hurting, you're vulnerable. When you're discouraged, that's when that member who's a wolf in sheep's clothing can come to you when they finish talking to you. They stay in the church, but they run you off. And see, your pain may cause you to do some things that you ordinarily wouldn't do and cause you to think some things that you ordinarily would not think. So the false prophets who had got it wrong every time because had they been right, they would have never been in captivity anyway. Because when Jeremiah was preaching saying, you're going into captivity, the false prophets were saying, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Jeremiah said, but it is. No, it's not going to happen. They, they even took Jeremiah to court. They, put him, they locked him up. They beat him. They did everything to him. So now there are false prophets in the crowd telling the people, hey, y'all, hey, I know you're hurt. I can't speak the language of the Chaldeans either. I hate uh, Nebuchadnezzar also. I don't like this place either. It's an ugly place. I wish we were in Jerusalem too. But I have news for you. Haka I, I have news for you. We won't be here long. Matter of fact, matter of fact, just hold your breath. We won't be here long. We are going back. To Jerusalem and it and it adversely affected the people and you know you have to admit now we're just as blind today people are blind people are blind it's amazing what you can get people to believe and uh, uh, since I preach mostly to our people we seem to be the blindest of all, you can get black folk to fall for anything. Anytime somebody can make you feel good about walking around with your pants hanging off your rear end and you don't have no shame, that's got to be something wrong with you. That's got to be something wrong. And any girl who would date a ninja walking around showing his drawers in public, that's something wrong with her. Come 
us and every other person. Have you noticed the program that's geared to us? Have you noticed the, the level, how low programs are that are geared to us? You don't need a plot. The, 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 the language barrier is automatically dropped to being profanity laced. Oh my, just everybody screwing everybody. There's no morals. And let me tell you, let me tell you, all when they show black men now, more often than not now, he's homosexual. He's effeminate. There is, I'm, I feel like preacher, there is a race to the bottom in our community and we need to turn this thing around and 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 bring back standards and race to the top now get mad and walk out get your grip get your coat get your family get that little boy with his pants hanging off and go on and walk out like you normally do but i'm telling you the truth somebody's got to say something Making our men, sisters, our girls, lesbians, our marriages are failing. And oh, oh, we've lowered the bar so. We've lowered the bar so. We've lowered it so. And, and we're not, I can't, I, let me tell you something. We're so low that a major political issue is voter ID. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm embarrassed that that would be an issue. I'm embarrassed when any member of any group representing African Americans will go on the news and say in 2019 that voter ID will restrict our ability, black people's ability to vote. If you don't have, if you don't have sense enough to get an ID, I question whether or not you ought to be voting. I mean, the, the ID is free. They'll uh, they're, they're give you the ID. You ain't got to pay for the ID and all that. Well, we're, we're against voter ID. You can't fly without an ID. You can't go to the hospital without an ID. You can't check out a library book without an ID. You can't cash a check without an ID. My, you can't get your medicine without ID. And yet, 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 that's an issue. It's always the bottom with us. But who will cry aloud and spare not? Oh! Now let me get back to Babylon. Which, to be honest, which, to be honest, I hadn't left. These false prophets say, oh no, oh no, we're not leaving. We're going to be here, we won't be here long. Jeremiah writes to them to address these false prophets. And there was another reason why he sent the letter. And I hope you grab this on a personal level. The other reason that he sent the letter is that life, he wanted them to know. Now hear me, saints, life cannot Grind to an halt during trouble time. Just because you're having a hard time, you can't stop living. You can't stop trying. You can't stop pressing forward. Oh, you ought to help me preach that one. Grab somebody by the hand and say, just because time is hard, you can't stop living. You got to, Sister Smith, you got to keep on keeping on. Ah! Ah! Got, to, got to keep on fighting. Got to keep moving. You know what you have to do? You got to adjust to the situation. Deacon Smith is in heaven now. You know what you're left to do? You can't die until it's time for you to die. Mother Turner tell you, you got to adjust. It's a, it's a new situation, but you got to adjust to it. Then when your mama died, you had to adjust. 
in life you have to adjust you can't stop you can't quit you got to keep on keeping on Woo! somebody throw your hands up and ask the Lord for power to adjust Until you bless me to recover, until you restore me, give me power to adjust. So Jeremiah writes and says, look, adjust, build houses, get married, raise children, pray for the peace of the city you're in, for in that peace you will have peace. Wouldn't that be good? If, we, if somebody would just tell our people, achieve. Stop all that complaining. Achieve. Stop all that whining. Drop that spirit of entitlement. Don't nobody owe you a thing. Well, you know we were all slaves. You weren't a slave. You've never been in slavery. And most of you young folk, ever since you've been in this world, you've had opportunities after opportunities after opportunities after opportunities. I can't help it because you chose drugs. You chose to go south. Turn your life around. Turn your life around. You can't blame somebody else because you decided you wanted fornication more than you wanted to aid that you wanted sex more than you wanted to achieve, that you wanted to be popular more than you wanted to be smart. You can't blame the, the world for that. He said, build, multiply, grow. Said because, now you got to adjust. He said, because now you're not gonna leave here. Mm, I'm almost done. Until the 70 years is up. Somebody said, what's the significance of 70 years? According to Psalm 90 and 10, 70 years represents a lifetime. Oh, Lord. God promised us 70 and said if by reason of strength we get 80 years, it's going to be full of troubles and tough labor. Oh, Lord. So he said, you got to, you got to deal with this until the time is right. Mm, he said, ah, you're going to be there 70 years. But in verse 10, he said, Thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I'm going to visit you. I'm going to visit you. God spoke to me this morning, and he said, Tell somebody that 2018 was there 70 years, oh Lord. But here we are in 2019 and God's getting ready to visit and to turn things around. I wonder who have a spirit of expectation. Oh, I wonder who, oh Lord, who is thirsty for a move of God. Thank you, Jesus. He said, I will visit you and perform my good word. Somebody shout good word. My good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. Other words, after 70 years, I'm bringing you back to Jerusalem. I told you God has a word of restoration and a word of recovery. He knows how to put you back to where you were. He knows how to make you feel whole again. He knows how to turn things. Oh Lord, he knows how, but you got to serve him and walk up right. Hallelujah. And then he reminds them that he hadn't changed his mind. Somebody shout, neighbor. I, you know, I don't. I, I normally don't have you preaching to your neighbor, but I got to have you today because you need to help me. God told me to tell your neighbor that he has not changed his mind toward you. Oh, the Lord 
and change his mind. Ah, yeah! Ah, yeah! Oh, Lord. What do you mean, preacher? What do you mean when you say God hadn't changed his mind? He said in verse 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you. I know what I've been thinking all the time. The thoughts of good and not of evil. I hadn't changed my mind, even though it may look like it, even though you may have been through, even though it may have been hard. I want you to know that what I promised you, I hadn't changed my mind. So you can get happy because I'm gonna bring you to that expected end. I'm gonna do what I said I was gonna do. Yeah, yeah. Can I get a praise in here somewhere? Somebody receive it. Somebody receive it. Receive it for yourself. What the Lord promised me, he's going to do it. I've been through the storm, and I've been through the rain. But ah, ah, God has a restoration for me. The Lord has a hope and a future, a hope and a future, a hope and a future. That's what expecting means, and expected in means. You got a hope and a future. You got hope and a future. Hope and a future. I know you feel like you wanna die, but you still have a future. I know you felt like you wanna give up, but you still have a future. Son, God has a hope and a future. You have a future. Do you believe? That you have a future. Do you believe that it's going to get better? Do you believe? Oh, I have a hope and a future. Yeah! Yeah, hello! This high five, a few folk can tell him it's gonna happen. 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 I had the Bible say, let us not be weary in well doing, for we shall reap in due season. If you faint not, if you faint not, hey! Woo! <laughs> Look at that lady getting her praise on. Run! Run for your blessing! Run! Praise the Lord! And... And... Uh, I gotta finish here. He said... He said... Then... Verse 12, then, I wonder, could I get three people to just turn around in a circle on then? Then, see, then, the Bible teaches that with Joseph, he went through until the time of his word tried him. Now when the time was right, then, God brought him out of prison. Then, God made him prime minister of Egypt. God said for me to tell somebody that 
thing is now that sin has come today. Sin is now. He said, when you've done your time, when you've gone through, when you're 70 years up, sin. Thank you. Tell God thank you. He said, now, don't spend your time listening to the false prophets because they're going to give you fake expectations. But once you've gone through, and I've decided that the time you've suffered enough, then you can call me. Then you can pray. And you can go and pray. And that's when I'll hearken. And I'll get you out. That's when I'll change things for. And you shall seek me. You see, this is why you got to get in this. Because you see, this a shifting. A shifting has taken place in the spirit. And many who who had to go through, the Lord told me to tell you, you went through. You did your time. Now there's a shift. And you can ask the Lord for what you want and what you promised. What he promised you. You can call him. And you can seek him. And he will be found of you. Because this is the right time to ask God for a raise. It's the right time to ask God for deliverance. It's the right time. See, wasn't that he wasn't going to answer you. It wasn't that he wasn't able. It wasn't even necessarily that you were all that messed up. It was that the time hadn't tried you long enough to bring out what he wanted to bring out to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. But when 2019 came in, and the funny thing is, midnight, New Year's, only lasts really a few seconds. One minute after midnight, it's not midnight anymore. It's the next day. One minute after midnight. For somebody, your 70 years was up. And when you hear the church throw out a time for prayer, throw out a time to seek the Lord, throw out a time for communion and Foot washing, where we call for. That's the time for you to grab it. Because this is the time. And see, Thursday, I'm going to teach and show you crazy, just mind boggling things that God will do according to the scriptures once you've served your time. See, once, once you serve your time, it, it gets crazy. It gets crazy what God begins to do to bring you where he wants you to be. And it is unstoppable. Glory to God. Glory to God. Don't even try, hey, don't you even try to figure out how God 
is going to get you from where you are to where he promised you. Because I'm telling you, you'll never figure it out because he's not going to do it the way you're figuring it. He's going to do it in a way where you will know that it wasn't nobody but the Lord. Only God, only the Lord could have done this. So the command, I'm done, is given to us to seek, seek the Lord. The Lord told me to tell you, you thirsty ones out there, you did your time. And if you weren't thirsty, get thirsty. C -c Create a thirst. You know, Sometimes I, I, hear, I hear something preach, and I say, you know what? I want that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I want this thing. I want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of this move of God. I want to be a part of this 2019 move of God. Yes. Uncanny things. I want, I, want, I, want to, I want to start talking about it, but if I flash, if I give too much, they won't come Thursday night. You need to come. <laughs> say, well, I'm going to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, uh, Facebook in. You, that's fine if you're in Hawaii. But if you're anywhere in the vicinity, you come to church. That's part of being hungry. Hunger causes you to go beyond what's comfortable. I told you the Lord wants people to radically change what they plan to do to get into his presence. All who will say, the Lord has spoken to me today. That word was for me. I accept that letter. Thank you, Jeremiah, for writing it. Isn't it wonderful that he was concerned about them people and let them know even though you were down, God hadn't forgotten you. Not only has he not, for, has he not forgotten you, he has not changed his mind. Don't you ever make fun of or laugh at a saint who you hear tell of going through. Don't, don't do that. Uh, don't do that. Don't, don't point at them and say, see, God's getting them. No, no, no. You know what the Lord is doing. Because in God, it's not over until it's over. Mm -hmm. And he knows how to turn things around. Can I get a witness? Oh, Lord. The Bible says there's hope for a tree. That if it is hewed down, it will sprout again. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that God knows how to raise you up. Oh, Lord. If I'm talking to you, look at that. Before I even made the altar call, preacher, I want this. said seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart the Lord said seek me Search for me, search for me with all your heart. When you search for me, 